What's up, everybody? Good afternoon. Come on, you do better than that. Good afternoon, everybody. Let's welcome all those watching online. We're so glad you're with us. And uh, honor, honestly, I'm just so grateful, blessed, and really honored to be here. And uh, I, I, could, I could literally talk for the whole time about your pastors and how amazing they are. I'm grateful for their friendship. One little picture that I felt like God gave me was when Jesus came up out of the water uh, before his ministry, Holy Spirit came on him. Father said, this is my son who I'm pleased with. And I really felt that prophetically for your body, uh, that in this moment, as we emerge out of the pandemic and as we come out of the craziness, I really feel like uh, God is saying to your church, to your pastors, I'm pleased with you. And the Holy Spirit is on you. And that Holy Spirit is my influence and platform. And your church is needed your church is needed around the nation, and your pastor's voice is needed. So uh, to stand here today, I'm really grateful, and, and I love your pastor. And can we just take a moment? Let's say thanks to God for them, okay? Don't golf clap them, all right? Amen. I'm ready to get into God's word today, but before I do, obviously I'm from Philadelphia, started the Block Church uh, seven years ago, and uh, our mission is to revive every block. So we're trying to plant as many churches and as many neighborhoods in our city as possible. We're not on the suburbs, we are in the interior of the city. And I want to introduce you to my wife and my family, my wife Lauren, and uh, our brand new baby Jovi, and uh, we're having, having fun. She's such an angel. And the reason God gave us such an angel is because uh, my son Maverick is a terrorist. <laughs> but, he, but he loves Jesus and I wouldn't trade him for anything. I love him so much. We also have a dog. His name is Phil. And uh, now, now Phil, okay, you know the scripture that says the devil masquerades as an angel of light? That's my dog Phil. He'll, he still pees on people all these years later. But he's so cute, so it just you get away with anything, right? So that's my family, and uh, and anyway, um, we're, we're having having a ball. My wife and I were here this week at an event, but she went home because much like Pastor Amy, she runs the show back in Philadelphia. So I give you my greetings from her. All right, ready to hear God's word? So how many of you uh, like to gamble and bet? Good job. I was going to see if you <laughs> lifted your hands in church, like all the hand emojis in the chat are going up. Uh, yeah, so, so I, look, I, I hate to lose money. I don't mind spending it when it's the right thing, but I don't like losing money unnecessarily. Uh, you know, w with this new baby girl, like she's adorable just as she is, but like I don't understand why we have to have 1,360 bows. You know what I'm saying? It's like, this is on an unnecessary spend. You know, like, I, when, I, when, you get, when you're single, I'm like, I'll eat whatever. You know, like hot dog, you know, whatever it is. Now that I'm married, it's like, we have to grocery shop? Like, all the time? It's like, what, do we need that much soap? You know what I'm saying? Like, I just don't love <laughs> to spend, well, to waste money. And, uh, you know, gambling can be one of those, you know, if it can be a payoff, but it can be a waste. And I read this story of this woman in Queens, New York. She was uh, playing on a slot machine, and the slot machine said she won $43 million. Yeah, hey, amen. Some guy's like, oh, yeah, you know. Well, I mean, you got to know, you usually, you, you don't win $43 million on a slot machine, but she believed. And so she went home that night, and I, I don't know about you, but if I won $43 million, I'm not, I'm burning my car on the way out, and I'm catching a helicopter home. <laughs> well, she goes home, celebrates that night, comes back the next day uh, to find out that the machine malfunctions. And she really only won $2.25. So for her troubles, they offered her a steak dinner. Now, again, I'm from Philadelphia, and here's what being saved from Philadelphia means. It means you, you have a Bible in one hand, but you also have brass knuckles in the other. You know, like, I would have been, I would have lost my mind. Anybody? But, you know, I was thinking, that's kind of how the devil does us. This is exactly how the enemy plays. It's deception. 
The enemy will make you think or make you believe you've won. It's one way, and then the longer you go, you find out it's something else. He's a liar. He, he is a thief. He will get you to believe that this pleasure, this momentary satisfaction will fulfill you, but you'll find yourself more empty, more in need, more desperate, more broken later. A great example of this uh, is when Jesus is in the wilderness and he's fasting and he gets to the end of his fast and Satan shows up and says, hey Jesus, look at this kingdom. This is what you want, right? This is what you came for. He's asking him a trick question. It's deception. It's manipulation. And because Jesus did come for a kingdom, but not a kingdom that you can touch and hold, but a kingdom that's lived from the inside out. And so, of course, Jesus, although 100% man, also 100% God, full of God's spirit, is God's spirit, had the courage to say, no, I'm not going to trade what I really want for what I want right now. And this is the dichotomy of faith. Faith is simply this. It's you lose first, you win later. The, the spirit of this age, the enemy is, is you win now, but you lose later. Did you see the dichotomy? Jesus is like, look, if you want to find your life, you got to lose it. The enemy's like, hey, live your life. Get it. Live your truth. But that's just not how it works. And when we talk about betting, today I want to convince you to bet on God. I want to build your faith. In fact, the title of my message is How to Win a Bet. But here's what we know about betting on God. We're victors in Christ Jesus. The Bible says we're the head and not the tail. The Bible says that he works out all things for those who are called according to his purpose, we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. It's really not a gamble. It's really not a bet. We're winners. But as Pastor Ryan shared a couple weeks ago, the thing is, is a lot of us don't choose faith because of doubt and pride. So today, I want to help you demolish, extinguish, step on the neck of the enemy of doubt and pride and walk into all God has for you. Are you ready to receive that? If you are, say yes and amen. 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 Well, let's go to Exodus chapter 14. Before I read, let me, let me give you a little context here. Uh, story of Moses. You've seen the prince of Egypt, I hope. If not, go back. Watch it later. Or read the Bible, one of the two. And, uh, and it's the story of Moses. Moses is a Hebrew boy. The Bible says he's no ordinary child, has this great call on his life, but he lives in lavish luxury, goes, grows up in the Egyptian palace. And, but he's got this holy discontent. You know what I'm talking about, right? Like, like, I got it all. For some reason, I got the house and the stuff and the money, but there's something inside of me going, there's more. That holy, that, that unho that holy unrest. It's actually healthy. It's God speaking to you. So he has this and he sees the people of God, uh, God's people, the Hebrews, enslaved. And he's so frustrated he kills somebody. And when he kills the Egyptian, he runs away and ends up isolated in a place where he thinks he's alone. But he's actually running into God's designed and divined meeting. Some of us run from God, and we find that in our running from God, we're actually running into his arms. And so he experiences this burning bush, if you will, which is kind of impossible, and God speaks and gives him this staff and says, I'm changing everything. Go back and shepherd my people. Go back and pastor my people. Go and lead them out of slavery. And he, and he goes, and he's got a speech impediment. And isn't it good news, by the way, that God saw a murderer and somebody with a speech problem and said, you're the guy I was looking for. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Come on, anybody in CR? Come on, you're here who God's looking for. Come on, everybody, anybody who lived a, a life messed up or full of hang-ups or troubles or sinful life, like this is who God was looking for, a murderer and somebody who couldn't talk. And he says, I want, to, I want you to talk. <laughs> That's how God does it. 
So he goes and he goes to Pharaoh, his old pal, and there's these ten plagues, and it's and it's crazy. And the last one, all the firstborn of Egypt die. And Pharaoh's like, I've had enough. Get these people out of here. But of course, you know the enemy. The enemy will always go back on what he says. And so as the people of God stand at the precipice of their promised land, they, of course, they're at their first faith obstacle, which is the water. The Egyptians come to kill them. And that's where we pick up. Exodus chapter 14, verse 10. The Bible says, when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the wilderness. You realize that we do our leaders like that all the time. All the time, like our pastor, Pastor Ryan, is preaching us good word, tough truth. And we're like, ooh, I don't like how you're saying that. Why are you trying to get me to live righteously? Why are you trying to teach me God's word? And, and poor pastor is just like, it's not my opinion, it's the Bible. I'm just trying to get you to victory. And we complain, right? And we do our leaders like that all the time. And here they are, they're, they're, they're at the precipice of this moment of the water, of their victory, of what generations longed for, and they're crying to go back to slavery. What the Israelites are saying is, God, leave me alone in Egypt. It's better to be a slave of my enemy than to have my freedom for eternity. And which is really an image of following Jesus. We stand at the water's edge deciding if slavery, if old mindsets, if comfort is better than surrender. All who have been there previously, who've made that decision to follow Christ in fullness, have made the decision to go forward and determined it was worth dying on their own terms. What do I mean by that? Dying on your own terms. Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 6. Let me read it to you. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. In other words, you're going to die either way. You follow me? Here's the, here's the Israelites, which is, which is usually us, and, and we're going, hey, take us back to slavery. It was easier there. And what the writer Paul is saying, and, and really what Moses is leading them to do is, hey, guys, you're going to die either way. You're either going to die as a slave to our enemy, or you're going to die in victory as a Christ follower. One death, one death is destruction. The other death is new life. This is the journey of following Jesus. It's, it's God saying you get to die on your own terms. It's either crucified with Christ so no longer you live but Christ who lives in you. Or go back to your comforts. Go back to your old mindsets. Go back to the old way. And it might be easier but it's long term death. The reality is this. is You want to win a bet. You want to really see God move in your life? You want to see everything that God's promised you? You have to know that comfort is the enemy to faith. You write that down. Comfort is the enemy of faith. A lot of us, well, we're obsessed with our comforts. We worship our comforts. You're like, oh, it's, it's just, it's easier if, if I just keep living with my girlfriend. It's just, it's just better financially. Well, 
Man, it might be comfortable, but it's also choosing slavery to sin. It's like, oh, but I'm, I'm just, I'm in this business partnership, and I know it doesn't glorify God, but it's just, it's working, and it's a little bit easier. And God's going, yeah, but I got better for you. I don't know what your comforts are. I don't know if you're comfortable not having accountability, but every once in a while you can't stop the temptation and you start to look at pornography and you're going, oh, but it's just comfortable not telling anybody because I don't want anybody in my business. Or you've got this relationship that is emotional and you know that emotionally you're cheating on your spouse, but it's comfortable. They give you comfort, but you don't want to deal with it. I I don't know what your comfort is, but we all have comforts. And I'm not talking about the comfort that God's promised when you and your 13-year-old girlfriend break up. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the comfort where God wraps his arms around you and someone you love dies. I'm not talking about the peace that surpasses all understanding. I'm talking about the stuff that keeps you from all God has for you. I'm even talking about the stuff Paul says that, hey, this is maybe permissible, but it's not beneficial. Because we have some of those too. Where it's like, I'm not in sin, but I'm not really in victory. And this is where the people of God are. They're, They're going... Oh, but it was, it was like at least they fed us there. How are we going to eat here? I mean, at least, at least like we, we had somewhere to sleep. It looks like we're going to be sailing. You know, eight years ago, my wife and I moved into Philadelphia. I'm originally from Philly. And in high school, I went, no, I went to high school in Florida. I really met Christ and I felt God call me in high school to go back to Philly at some point and plant a church. And I didn't know all that that meant, but my wife and I, we had gotten married and we were living in Illinois and we were comfortable. We had decent jobs and I was doing the football thing and as Pastor Ryan mentioned and I just knew God was calling us to something more. I, I had a, I had a, a holy discontentment. I, I had something that wouldn't sleep inside of me. And so we made the decision, okay, we're moving to Philadelphia. And when we moved there, I was, before we went, I was like, we got to save money so we can survive. And so we get there and nobody wants to rent us anywhere to live because we don't have W-2s. So we can't buy a house we, we can't really rent anything. And I'm like, well, what are we going to do? And you have to understand something about Philadelphia. It's a tough place. I mean, you know, in, in one neighborhood, you, you've got the largest open-air drug market in the Northeast. I mean, it's zombie land. It's awful. Uh, on the next neighborhood, you've got more people getting murdered in an afternoon than, you know, than you, you play in your video games. And then in the next neighborhood, it's like, oh, I can't afford to drink coffee. It's so expensive. You know, so this is the dynamics of our city. And, and so finally I find this guy and he's like, all right, well, you can rent this house. And I liked it because the living room was big enough, even though it was a row home. And I'm like, I can just invite people here. And so he's like, but I need six months up front. Six months. This is criminal. Welcome to Philadelphia. He's like, oh, and by the way, I also need first, last, and security too. So I'm like, okay, God. I'm betting on you now. And in one fell swoop of the pen, nine months of our year we saved. And I looked at my wife. I said, you got to get a job. (laughs) I'm going to go meet people. And it was hard. I mean, it was months and months of no, no, no. No, no venues. I'm going to, I'm asking people if they want to rent to a church. I'm like, we'll be good tenants. We'll, we'll, we'll serve the community. They're like, I don't care about you serving the community. Like bleep you. You know what I mean? Like it was just, just constant. No, constant until finally at the very end, before we were supposed to launch, we find this venue in a catering hall. And despite all of the challenges, we kept saying yes to God and kept saying, I know it's comfortable over there, but it's not what we were called to. And in April, we launched our seventh location. We've seen thousands of people come to Christ. Over the next couple of years, we'll have baptized our thousandth person. 
I'm not the hero of this story. I'm, I'm literally just an Israelite that said, okay, <laughs> I'm going to die either way. <laughs> By my wife. <laughs> Or by saying, may I be crucified with Christ. God, live through me. And in verse, I think it's 14, 13, Moses says to the people, fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to be silent. I love that passage for two reasons. God says through Moses, you're never going to see the enemy ever again. Do you know what happens to a lot of us? Is we say yes to God. But then we kind of take measures into our own hands. All right, this is a good example. You know you're dating somebody that doesn't love the Lord. And God's like, get end that relationship. Right? Come on. Come on, somebody. Come on. Whoever you Or whatever. And then like, and then, but like you just, you feel, you're scared you're going to stay alone. So you keep coming back, right? And you just, you don't really let it end. And you waste time and energy. And it's not going to work anyway. And I don't know what it is for you, but it's like, it's like what God wants for you, the word fight there, the, the original language, is devour. Like God doesn't just want you uh, to, to take a break from your enemy. He wants to break up with the enemy in your life. He's on like, like, oh, you, you, can, you can have some victory because it's Sunday and you're in church and it's, you know, you're feeling good because you're worshiping and you're going you're gonna to make it through this day. No, God's like, I want to break the bondages that have held you for years. I want you to get full victory, not partial victory. And you can. How do we do it? But we, have, we, we know that, that, that enemy, or excuse me, comfort is, is the enemy of faith. But, but the next part of that betting on God and winning is, is the fact that you've got to release control. You, you, you have to release control and stop trying to do God's job for him. We don't know how to be still. We're just the, 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 the social media, the, 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 the TV, the, the computer, the emails. We're, we're nuts. I mean, we, we just, we're just, our mind is always going. And I, I envy some of the generations above me that, that don't care about their telephone. I want to be like you. I want to be present. Because, because what, what we do, here's what we do. We see the water. We feel the enemy because the enemy's coming, especially when you say yes to God, especially when you're under good leadership. And, and so what we do is we're like, ah, this seems too hard. This seems impossible. So what we do is we're like, well, I'll just walk around. I'll just go around the ocean. And we don't realize you can't walk around a sea. Because what ends up happening is, is because God loves you so much, he's like, you're going to have to retake this test. I had a dream last night. I'm just remembering this, that I got an almost perfect score on my SATs, which is so far from the truth, which has nothing to do with this sermon other than the fact that I took my SATs twice and only got 40 more points that I needed to to get into college. Look, see if God can use a murderer. He can use somebody who doesn't know how to do math, okay? <laughs> I was trying to do alliteration, murderer, math. Anyway, do you understand what I'm saying? It's like, it's like we, we end up having to repeat the same test. We waste time when we don't just say, okay, God, I trust you. I'm going to do it your way. And I just wonder, let's just be Moses for a second. We're not. We're the Israelites. But let's pretend we're Moses for a second. We're standing on the precipice of the ocean of the promised land. And, 
we're looking back and, he, and we make this bold proclamation. And, and when we look in the water, what do we see? What, when we take things into our own hands, we see our own strength. We see the murderer, we see the stutterer, we see the fear, we see the doubt, we see the failures. But when we say, okay, God, I'm betting on you, I trust you, I release control, all of a sudden what we see, it changes. The courage of God begins to rise up. We don't see the murderer anymore, we see the shepherd. Well, we, we don't see someone with a speech impediment. We see somebody who's an author, who's someone who declares. What Moses is in this moment is he's a type and shadow of Christ. He's the image of Christ, our Redeemer. We, friends, are often the complaining Israelites. Boo-hoo. And if Jesus were to speak to you today, he would be saying the same thing Moses would. In fact, I know it's true, and this is what Jesus says to you. He says, fear not, trust me. Jesus says to you, lean not on your own understanding. I do miracles. You just got to put yourself in position to need one. He says, I'll carry your burdens. Plant the seed. I'll make it grow. Better yet, be the seed and I'll make you grow. Have faith. I'll go before you. I'll fight for you. Be still. Know that I'm God. See, when you position yourself for a miracle, when you position yourself for Jesus to be your redeemer, then he actually becomes your redeemer. He, standing at the water's edge, taking faith risks. You know, you guys just finished a series all in. Well, now's the time to go all in. Heard a lot of good sermons. Oh, Dorothy, that was good. <laughs> but now is the moment. Do I go all in or do I go back to Egypt? But the only way is to release control. Say, say God, I, I trust you. And when you do that, it's the proclamation that Jesus is your Lord, that Jesus is your God, that Jesus is your Redeemer, that Jesus is going to fight battles for you. You know, this happens to pastors sometimes and... Um, and I don't ever want to take away from other pastors or other people's context. But again, Philadelphia, not the easiest place in the world to plant a church. And there's a lot of craziness going on. And there's such a, there's such a dark spirit. There's a, there's, a, there's a principality that has reigned over this city for a long time. And, and as we've done the work that God's called us to, there's been a lot of pushback. And there's been one particular individual who just for years would send awful emails to us, but whatever. But then in the new year started showing up at the office going, Pastor Joey, is he here? Tell him to stop harassing me. Tell him to stop following me. And leaving notes on our office door. Isn't it funny, though, that the enemy still knows your name and whose authority you're under? Anyway, so then they start showing up at my house. Of course, we're in the city. Little do I know, they live a block away writing notes. I'm going to burn your house down. I'm going to kill your family. And my wife's like, what are we doing about this? And I was like, we're only going to be still and let God fight for it. And also we're going to call the police. <laughs> Which, and not their fault, but doesn't amount to much. And... Our city, and so, anyway, um, I'm at the park one day. <clears throat> my son's playing in the water, and I'm just texting my wife. It's like a rare, nice weather day, and I'm making Philly sound really bad. It is, but it's also great. <laughs> and this, 
this person is like, I look up and they're standing over me, like, like super like Alfred Hitchcock kind of creepy, you know, and waits till I look up and they're like, stop following me. Stop harassing me. You left a dead bird in my house. I was like, you got me. That's, that's my signature move, you know? <laughs> and you're screaming and cursing. And so I'm like, hey, this is not the place. This is a park. And my son runs over, and he's three at this point. I pick him up, and we start backing up. Start backing up. And um, she throws her... Sorry, I didn't want to say it was a woman, but here we are. Throws her bag on the, on the thing and starts fumbling through her bag. And I'm thinking to myself two things, two thoughts. I'm going to die today. And, and so... Here are my two thoughts. I'm, I'm going to throw my son as far as I can so he doesn't get shot. Because I'm thinking she's pulling out a gun. And just run home, three-year-olds, if you know where that is. And then also, I'm so glad I lived long enough to see the Eagles win the Super Bowl. These were my thoughts. <laughs> it's going to happen for you at some point, guys. It's going to happen. And so she pulls out. She pulls out an axe, and it's kind of funny now. You can laugh. I know you're like, oh, am I allowed to laugh? This is this is a man's life. Um, but I was like, I can survive this, I think, you know. So I call 911 as I'm like, you know, 30 feet away. And they, no joke, they're like, like, thank you for telling us, does anyone have COVID at the park? I'm like, what did you just ask me? <laughs> like, and I'm like, I don't know. I'm going to die. Please send somebody. If I do die, feel free to count it as a COVID case. <laughs> but just, please. I don't know. Like, what do you want? So I hang up on her. Later, when I got to the police department, they were like, hey, they said you were real unruly on the phone. <laughs> Well, anyway, I call a police officer in our church. Poor lady was at her daughter's wedding. She says, stay where you are. Don't leave the park. They're going to kill you. And I'm going to call my sergeant. And so, I, so for the next 15 minutes, I, and thankfully, little fat fit, you know, I'm like, you know, moving around, dodging her, hiding behind swings and hiding behind like the center of the playground and just evading this person as they chase me in the park. Eventually, the police show up, and, and, and she runs away, and then they get her. And, um, but I had these thoughts while this was happening. I'm like, okay, my, my instinct is to just fight back, right? Because I'm going to show my son how to, you know, you know, I'm like, whatever, that's my thought. But then I was like, I, just felt, I kept hearing the Holy Spirit, stop, wait. I'm going to fight your battle for you. Stop. Wait. Because then I had the thought, okay, if I do fight back, she's going to end up being the victim, and I'm going to be the one that gets in trouble. And so I just felt like the Holy Spirit was just wait, just wait, just wait. And thank God here I stand today. I'm glad I trusted him. But, like, the question for you is, and where you need to make this fit in your context is, is the enemy is chasing you down. The, the enemy does know your name. And he is coming with weapons of warfare that aren't fair. But guess what? You do have the armor of God you can put on. You can throw up that shield of faith and pick up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God that you've got to use against him and say, God, I'm going to wait. And I know some of you are facing wayward kids right now and you so badly want God to bring them home, but you've got to pray, you've got to wait. I know some of you are dealing with job situations that feel unfair and bosses who are awful. Pray and wait. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's a lost spouse and you're just like, God, save them. Well, you're here. Pray and wait. Maybe it's a diagnosis and there's literally nothing you can do. God, I wait on you. Aren't you tired of living off of somebody else's story? Don't you want a miracle for yourself? I remember the verse that says, they that await on the Lord. 
Come on, somebody. They that wait on the Lord. Bet on God. And you know what? God, if you drown me in the water, if I die, well, you know what Paul says? Heck, I ran, and this is not his word, I mean, verbatim, but like, I, it's better to be dead and be with God. Absent of the body is, so it's like, you're going to die either way. How you want to go? God's arms, arms of the enemy. And the last part of this I love, and I'm, I'm running out of time, but verse 15, the Lord says to Moses, dude, why do you cry to me? Tell the people, I've already told you what to do. Tell the people, go forward. Come on, go forward. You know what the original Hebrew means here? Forward means to pull out or up, set out, and journey. Go. Move. But as they were being delivered to the Red Sea... In a lot of ways, this represents them coming up out of the grave. This actually is a great picture of baptism. If you've been baptized, you don't baptize yourself, right? Somebody baptizes you. Somebody is with you. And, and if we're going to exceed and win in this faith journey, we never go alone. We never go alone. Men... If we're going to be all that we're supposed to be, we don't, we don't lead our families alone. We were given a partner. We have other brothers. You're going to walk in all God's called you to do. You're going to write the book and start the podcast and begin the business or go plant the church or whatever you sense God called. You don't do it alone. And I just, this picture... As we close this picture of, of Moses and the people of Israel, like having to decide very quickly, because you understand that this is happening in a matter of moments. Somebody's got to take the first step. And I wasn't there. I know I'm balding and getting old, but I promise I wasn't there. But I imagine it happening like this. I, I imagine the waters parting ever so slowly. Because why? Because if it just opened up and they started to run like maniacs, who would get the glory for their victory? They would. They'd forget real quick that it was God who did the ten plagues and it was God who opened up the sea. They, and it, we know this to be true because later on they wander when they didn't have to. But it's like God opens up and you just see the water as they're walking. Just oh, ever so slowly. God, I'm getting my... My sandal's a little wet here, but I'm moving forwards. Oh, look, oh my God. God, look, look at the fish. Look at the sharks. Look at the piranhas. I don't know what's in there. But like, every, like God, look what you're doing, and it's a process, and, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I can imagine little kids and, 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 and little brothers and sisters being scared but excited and grabbing somebody's hand. This is the picture of the church. This is the picture of the kingdom. It's like I succeed because we go together. You know the old statement, if you want to go fast, you go alone, but if you want to go far, you go together. This is what God wants. God wanted the nation free. God wants his church free. God wants your family free. God wants your workplace saved. And the thing is, Generation Church, we're building buildings because we believe the best days are ahead. Right? We, we're believing more salvations, more souls, more baptisms, the kingdom advancing, more people fed. Right? But we never do it by ourselves. Bet on God. We bet on God by holding each other. He's never failed us yet. He's never failed us yet. Come on, he's never failed us yet. He's never failed us yet. And he won't. Come on, he won't. You believe that today. If you would, I'd love for you to stand to your feet and bow your head and close your eyes and 
If you're online, I'd love for you to stay and continue to participate with us. But I know there's people in this place that you are up against making some major decisions, some faith decisions, some financial decisions, some marriage decisions, some business decisions, some living situation decisions, some friendship decisions. I don't know what it is, but there's some faith decisions and you're at the precipice of the water and you're like, oh, comfort just seems so good. And God's saying, I got a call for you. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, right now over every person on the precipice of their destiny. I pray, Jesus, that you would fill mightily with your Holy Spirit courage for those needing to take steps of faith. Holy Spirit, right now, I pray that you would encourage someone to trust you and to bet on you. I come against every lie and attack of the enemy that tries to steal from you, that tries to keep you from your potential, that's trying to destroy your family and your marriage and your kids and your health. We step on the neck of the enemy right now in Jesus' name. I just declare victory over this house and over your life and over your house today. And there's people here today your first step of faith is just to come home to Jesus. Your first step is to say, I need God. I don't have a relationship with him. or I've never invited him to be my savior before. Man, at one point I was following him, but I'm not anymore. And if that's you in this place, today is the day. Don't harden your heart. Salvation has come to your house. I know there's people right now online in this place. And I would like everybody to say this prayer out loud to encourage those, but especially those who need to get right with God today. Can you pray this with me out loud? Can you say, Jesus, we love you and we need you. And today we ask, forgive us of our sin. Sit on the throne of our hearts. Be king of our lives. Raise us to new life like you were raised. Lead me all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.